Ah, la story began in 1974 when news of a tragedy reached Norwegian lock engineer Tor Sarnes. His favorite American singer, Connie Francis, had been attacked by an intruder in her hotel room. Hmm. Tour couldn't believe that this had happened. He resolved there and then to invent a door opening system that would provide a unique key for every hotel guest. His invention was Vincard, and it changed the whole lock industry. For decades to come, hotel guests all over the world could finally feel safe and secure when they arrived at their destinations. Vincard L-Safe has been an industry pioneer and world-leading brand for 40 years. We couldn't think of any way to make it more dramatic. The impact was more than 150 countries, more than 40,000 facilities, and millions of doors. Or if you're more of a visual type, we cannot name the brands that were impacted by this, but if you go to Asabloy's website, you will see these names there as their reference. Or, if you would like to have more pretty pictures, these type of cards or locking systems are being used in these type of facilities. So places like this and this and ships like this or this. Hello, we are the pen and teller of Infosec, except that we are not rich, famous, uh, funny, and the shorter guy talks. Right, Timo? Uh, so moving on. Uh, so we both work for F-Secure Cyber Consultancy, and that's about everything I'm going to say about that. The story goes back to 2003, where when we were visiting a hacker conference in Berlin, Germany. And once we got back to our hotel room, our friend's laptop had been stolen. We notified the hotel staff that the laptop had gone missing from his room, but for some odd reason, they didn't believe us. Although we are a bunch of distinguished gentlemen here, uh, for some reason, they didn't took us very, very seriously. So we decided to go where gender neutral has never gone before, and went to our favorite search engine and wanted to learn everything about hotel hacking. So typed in a bunch of new phrases here, here and there, and zero hits. So effectively, that means challenge accepted. So if you're going to attack something like this, you need to know where to start. And in this case, the attack tree is pretty straightforward. So you have a few things here and there. You have the actual mechanical locks, you have electronic locks, and then you have the access tokens and the backend system. Most people seem to think that all these things are interconnected somehow, but 95% of the hotel door locks are actually called passive locks. So there is typically just a real-time clock, some very, very rudimentary electronics, and a battery on those doors. So basically what you do is that you program the door or the lock using the access token, a card in this case. And then, of course, you have the back-end systems that are, you are being used to control the whole thing. So set the expiration dates, know who's where, and so on. 
If you want to go after these type of things, you first need to understand the target. And the only thing we had was this card, this very, very specific card. It was a Magstripe, Magstripe card from a company called Wingcard that we didn't know anything about. So first we decided to take a look at their website. Uh, it looked like something like this and decided to look a bit further. And looking a bit further means FTP. Remember, this is 2003. This is how hacking looked like back then. And because Anonymous FTP was all the rage back then, you could find all the goodies from their public FTP server. So mostly it's worth paying attention to the Locklink software over there, which is the software that is being used to program the locks. After that, we took a look at the patents. This is very often overlooked. So especially if you're lo looking at older technology, the patents contain tons of useful information. Nowadays, patents are much more vague, but back in the day, they used to contain a lot of good stuff, including, and not limited to, schematics, data structures, like very, very specific data structures, and golden nuggets like this. So how many of you knew that that Magstripe card that you've been using is actually red once you take it out of the lock? It's five times more accurate, and this whole system is patented because it's, it's obviously something super groundbreaking. So we have split this presentation into four parts, and Timo will now go through the first ones. The first thing that we tried was bypassing the mechanical lock without leaving any visible marks. The last part is important, without leaving visible marks. So the first thing you do is you need to get a lock. <clears throat> so what we did was we bought not one but two locks on eBay. We started analyzing the lock to find clever ways to somehow open it. We tried things like hitting the lock with a rubber hammer, didn't work. Um, using a powerful magnet to open it, no luck. And in the end, we failed. This isn't really that surprising if you think about it. Asa Abloy has decades of experience in building high quality mechanical locks. So failing in bypassing the mechanical lock, maybe not that surprising. However, if you want to bypass the mechanical lock, there's a fairly cheap way to do it. You just go to the tri cleaners, you get one of those coat hangers, you slide it under the door, then you turn it upwards, and then you pull the handle of the hotel room from the inside. Soon you will see the same thing from the inside. So again, you have a thick metal wire, you slide it under the door, then you turn it up, like that, and you pull the handle. That's how you do it. Costs you maybe two euros. If you want to protect yourself against this attack, what you can do is you can place a towel between the handle and the door. That's your protection. So we needed a better plan. We started looking at bypassing the electronic lock instead. We already had the lock link software, and that's the software that you use to reprogram those locks. We had found the software uh, on an FTP site. The funny thing about the software is that if, if you want to run the software, you needed one of these Comeback iPad handheld computers. Pretty ancient stuff, so that's the device you see there marked with number one. We got one of those devices, we got the LockLink software running on the device, and rather quickly we learned that the interesting stuff doesn't happen in the software. So all the commands that are used to reprogram the lock, those commands are implemented in the item number five called the contact card. So the contact card is something that you connect to the compact iPad, and then the other end of the device, you slide that to the lock. So the same way you uh, insert one of those Magstripe cards to the lock. 
Unfortunately, we couldn't get our hands on one of those contact cards. So since we didn't have the hardware, we were unable to analyze how the reprogramming of the lock is really implemented. Again, another dead end. However, it, it was clear that we weren't the only ones thinking that this might be a nice way to get into a hotel room without leaving any kind of traces. In 2010, we learned about the assassination of Mahmoud al uh, He He was a Hamas officer and he was killed in his hotel room in Dubai. And according to the report by the Dubai police, he was murdered by Mossad, and the way Mossad got into the hotel room was using that same Wingard lock link software to reprogram the lock. So clearly this is an approach that works. However, there's at least two downsides to using this approach. One is that it, it leaves a mark. If you read the locks from the lock, you can see that the lock was reprogrammed. The second thing is that if you want to access multiple hotel rooms, you need to reprogram each and every lock. So not that scalable. And we decided that we need a more elegant plan than what the Mossad had. So what is left is the access tokens. So we came up with the cunning plan. So first we were going to be needing to understand how Magstripe works. So Magnetic Stripe card, very, very common. You know, it typically has three tracks. The tracks are pretty well documented. They are standardized. Unfortunately, um, oh yeah, the, there is the common structure that there is a start sentinel, and then there is some data, and end and sentinel, and LRC, which is kind of a checksum. Super simple stuff. Unfortunately, the wing card lock data is stored on track three and doesn't follow any of these conventions. So it's basically just a raw binary blob there. Uh, once we knew that, that okay, this is how Magstripe works, we wanted to get our hands to an encoder decoder. So this is a piece of equipment that is being used to read and write magnetic data on, on the cards. Luckily, there is a very, very cool German small one-man shop selling these type of items. This is called Maxstripe, M-A-K-S-T-R-I-P-E. And that beauty is capable of writing raw data, also reading raw data. And this is how it looks like. It comes with this software. And on, on the uh, right, upper right-hand side, you can see the swipe speed that was being used to read the data. Here you can see the modulation. You can zoom in if you want to which might come handy because I'm not going to say that anybody's using this, but for example, Finnavia is using this at their parking garage door. So if you want to park your car for free and copy those cars, so I'm not saying this, but it, it's, it might be the case. And here you can see if the track data has been used more than once. So this card has been used at least twice. And you see some additional information over here as well. All this information is relevant, especially the modulation, because like I mentioned, some of the cards use that as a copy protection scheme. And pretty much all the other encoders, decoders out there are doing the encoding, decoding process on the hardware. So you cannot impact it. You can't affect it. So this is what you want to have. Then we needed cards. We needed lots of cards, like thousands of cards and literally thousands of cards, because you want to have as many cards as you want, because the plan was to, uh, to take a copy of all those cards and look at those cards and maybe do some statistical analysis or something, those cards, and this is what we got. Uh, well, we did try hard. And there is some things that you can deduce from this, but uh, it doesn't really work. This might sound stupid, but it has been a solid approach. Many of the other hotel locking systems can be actually break. They will, they're, they're vulnerable to this type of analysis. So we didn't exactly succeed. So 
At this point, we just needed a plan. It doesn't have to be elegant anymore. The idea was that we need a copy of the vision software. So as Abloy has, has two different hotel or hospitality industry lock brands, as they call them. They have Vision, which has more lock, lock, it's an older system, it has more locking systems out there in the world, on the world. And then there's a Vision line, which is a bit newer system that we have not looked at. We were more interested in this, because this was the system that was being used in the hotel where our friend's laptop got stolen. So we wanted to get a copy of the Vision software. Uh, luckily, there's internet, so you just do some mad googling and you find the installation package, the full CD. And then you just reverse engineer this stuff and you come up with clever techniques and end up being a disobey, right? Uh, well, it turns out that um, in order to understand how this works, you have to read product manuals. It's, these things are very, very complicated. Actually, to be precise, you have to read more than 500 pages of product manuals. And once you're done with that, you really don't know where you are. So you have to document that. So we ended up drawing a mind map. Uh, when we showed this to the S. Abloy guys, they told us that we actually have a better documentation of their system than they do. Each one of these nodes can be opened, so you, you can take a look at all, all the use cases, all the different things that goes with the licensing information. If you click on any of the nodes, you will have mo more information about that specific node. So this was a combination of reading the manuals and going through the reverse code. Here you can see more information about the potential targets that we might be interested in. Um, here are all the different configuration states that the thing can be set to. And all of these are documented. So you kind of get the idea. At this point, we needed to build a hotel. And because we didn't have a time for it, so we decided to build a lab. So instead of building a hotel, we ended up looking like this. So we went into a hotel room and built our lab there, just to get more feeling into it. Unfortunately, it turns out that these encoder decoders are super, super sketchy. So if you swipe the same card twice, you will get different results. And if you're researching something, that's not, not, not exactly where you want to be. So instead, we would have needed this piece of hardware. Unfortunately, it costs thousands of euros and is very, very difficult to get. We did try, we failed. So that was not an option either. So we did, I decided to go after the RFID because this thing costs about 60 euros, and you can get them pretty much anywhere. At this point, we had a bit of an issue. None of the manuals actually mention that which hardware is compatible with the Vision software. So we were pretty sure that this hardware would work. And after 20 hours, we actually learned that if you rerun the installer, it actually works, and we finally had our setup up and running. We, went, we felt really uber at this point. Um, yes, you can uh, do your own cards at this point, so you can have your own demo hotel, and you can issue cards for different rooms. And there you can see that, okay, you, if you verify a card against the reader, you will see that, OK, this is a valid card. It, it will also tell you that if it's a valid card, but not for your facility. And see something interesting there. It says that it's a Vision Demo Hotel. And we didn't really know if we were missing some functionality because of the tem demo installation, because we didn't have a valid license. And one of the cool things you can learn when you're reading manuals is that you learn how to configure these things. So at the manual, they have this screenshot. And if you enter those details through the software, you actually get a licensed copy of it. So that's how you become a hacker. 
Um, then we had to learn something about RFID. We didn't know, literally didn't know anything about it. So we did, decided to do some reading. And I, I can tell you, if you have any sleeping issues, just go after this stuff. It's like watching pain dry. It will make your life very, very exciting. So we learned that there are a few different types of RFID cards. These are the most common ones. These are ultralight cards. Absolutely no protection whatsoever on the RFID side. Then you have ultralight EV1, which is basically the same thing with an added spice. It has a thing called shared secret. And so far, we have not really understood. Well, actually, we know that it has nothing to do with security. Because if you're just sniffing the traffic between the lock and the access token, you will see the shared secret. So it's not really that secret. So there are better RFID cards available. But on Visions, uh, on, uh, to, to be fair, with Vision, this didn't really matter. Because all the magic happens on the software side, or basically the data that, that is stored on the card. So now we decided that this is the proper point to do some reverse engineering and do some clever tricks with it. Before we go into the details, I, I need to say that we cannot disclose all the details. If we would tell you exactly how the attack works, that would put innocent people in danger. So instead of going to Central America and have mojitos with John McAfee, we decided to do the responsible thing. Here is the key data illustrated. So on an ultralight card, you have 64 or 48 bytes, depending on how you count it. The bytes highlighted in red, that's 33 bytes in total. And quite quickly, after analyzing those RFID cards, we, we realized that the, those 33 bytes are the same 33 bytes that you had on those MaxTripe cards. It's exactly the same data structure. So we already knew that the way the data is encrypted is, is using a single byte XOR key. And the first byte you have there, that's, that's the XOR key. It's also the checksum for the rest of the data. Very simple encryption to decrypt. That's, that's not the challenge here, trust me. The format of the data is, is quite interesting. And when I say interesting, I mean super annoying. Because the way it works is that, let's say you have a logical value of one byte, eight bits. It might be that you have five bits here at one offset, then you have two bits here at a different offset, and then the last bit at yet another offset. So this kind of a data format is, is a pain to deal with. Fortunately, we found a good tool for this. And for example, that chart over there, it's generated using Kaitai struct. What you can do with Kaitai struct is that you first describe the data. Basically, you just give IDs or labels to all the different bit sequences that you have. And then when you have labeled those, then you can say that, OK, this logical value here, you take those bits, those bits, and those, and that's it. This is super handy, because when you first describe your data, then you can generate those graphs. And it can also automatically generate code that then decodes or, or deserializes the data that you have. And you can generate those, those parsers for multiple different programming languages. In our case, the language was Python. Now that we have a working lab environment, <laughs> finally, immediately after 20 hours, uh, the, quest, the quest for the master key begins. The obvious thing to do, I think, is that when you have the lab environment, you first generate the master key in your own lab environment. And then what you do is you update the facility code in that master key to match the facility code of a real hotel. So the facility code is simply a number that more or less uniquely identifies that facility or hotel. This would have been too easy. I mean, changing just one value, no. 
we, we couldn't generate a working master key for a real hotel like this. Instead, we decided to try something more simple, just cloning a hotel key. So we took a normal hotel key, we read the data from the cart using that Omni key RFID reader we showed earlier, and then we wrote the same data back to another normal RFID tag. And it didn't work. Come on, we, we copied those bytes exactly, and it didn't work. The trick here is that we used those normal ultralight cards. We didn't use the Chinese version where you can actually control the unique ID that's like in the first seven or eight bytes of the data. If you use a Chinese card, yeah, then you can do the cloning. But if you cannot control the RFID UID, then you need to be able to understand the data structure better. So we went back to the drawing board, and in our case, drawing board is IDA Pro and Immunity Debugger. We did some more reverse engineering, and we learned that the last four bytes that you have on the hotel key card, those are a kind of a checksum. And the checksum is calculated from two pieces of data. One is the facility code, and one is the unique identifier of that RFID card. Once we learned how that algorithm works, then we were able to clone those cards to these regular uh, MyFair ultralight cards. The next thing we wanted to do was, instead of creating a physical copy, instead of writing it the physical tag, we wanted to be able to simulate those keys. And for that purpose, we used the Proxmark 3 hardware. Again, this should have been easy because Proxmark already supports simulating RFID cards. It even supports simulating ultralight cards. <laughs> and it failed. I mean, this was pretty devastating. I mean, Proxmark has been around for years. And when you realize that it doesn't do the stuff that it's supposed to do, and this isn't I mean, this isn't even magic. This is a fairly simple use case. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't exactly motivating to learn that the tooling fails at something as simple as this. However, we knew that we need to get the <laughs> simulation working. So the, <laughs> the only option was to start troubleshooting what's wrong. So we did some troubleshooting. One of the things that we did was we used the original key card, and then we sniffed the traffic with Proxmark, recorded all the traffic between the lock and the key, and then we simulated the key, again recorded all the radio traffic, and then we compared those two versions, so the simulated and the original key, and the bytes were identical. Exactly the same bytes were sent between the lock and the key, and still one works and the other doesn't. And this was like, <laughs> yeah. So we started having fun by <laughs> reading the ISO standards, and that's the state machine. It's a fairly simple state machine that you have on those ultralight cards. And before you get to the interesting stuff, so reading data from the card and writing data to the card, you, you first need to complete, complete a handshake. It's, it's called the anti-collision protocol. What the anti-collision simply means is that if you have a reader, and then if you have multiple different RFID tags within the radio field, the anti-collision protocol is used um, by the reader to select that what are the tags that it talks to. Basically, it says that, OK, who's out there? Then all the tags say that, hey, I'm here. And then it says, OK, now you can talk. The rest of you shut up, and then it talks to those tags one by one. That's the anti-collision protocol simplified. What we learned was that where this thing fails is during that simple anti-collision protocol. So you, you can think of it as failing a handshake. So that's, that's not a good start. So we started reading the next ISO standard, which is one layer below <laughs> in the protocol stack. That's on the radio layer. 
and I don't know anything about signal processing or anything. And we learned that the protocol is like truly awesome. The way it works is that depending on what the reader, in this case the log, sends to the card, depending on the last bit of the data, the tag or the hotel key card needs to wait for a different amount of time before sending data back. So depending on the last bit sent by the reader, there's a different delay. And if you get the delay wrong, the anti-collision fails. So you so need to get it right. Essentially, it did work with some of the cards if yeah. we were lucky and the data happened to be right. And sometimes, mm -hmm. well, most of the times, it didn't, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the lovely thing that if you simulated a card that had a seven byte UID that was all zeros, it worked fine. Then if you change one of the bits, suddenly it doesn't work anymore because different bits are transmitted. So trust me, this was a lovely pro <laughs> problem to debug. Once we figured out where the problem was, the fix was simple. And, and the good news here is that there was at least some way of giving back to the community. So when we figured out the problem, we wrote a simple patch and then we, we uh, created a pull request for the Iceman fork and the pull request was quite, quite quickly merged. So hopefully nobody needs to run into this problem again. And I also want to be totally clear that even though I said that it was super frustrating that Proxmark, which is supposed to be reliable hardware, didn't work in our case, we couldn't have done this research or this attack without hardware like Proxmark. We certainly don't have the skills to design hardware like that. So we, we were lucky to have Proxmark, even though the firmware had a bug like this. OK, now we're able to simulate key cards. That's a good thing. We started figuring out what are the relevant logical values for creating a master key. So within those 33 bytes, you have multiple different logical values. And when you do some reverse engineering, you learn some of the, let's say, human readable names of these fields. Now imagine that you're, you're testing a web, web application, and in the URL you see a parameter that says admin equals false. One of the things you probably do is you try admin equals true. This is the same kind of situation. Some of the logical fields had like super promising names, like if I modify that value, I bet I'm going to get a master key. And I, I did bet that I'm going to get a master key, but no. <laughs> we failed again. And we, we never considered giving up. I think that's fair to say. Well, it took 15 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> it took only 15 years. We, we never really considered giving up, but at this point, I would say we were quite <laughs> close to considering it. We were testing that. It. Yeah. <laughs> so th th this was disappointing, because at this point, we should have had at least some success already. So after this failed, there was a radio silence of maybe five minutes, and then we started uh, exchanging signal messages again, coming up with new ideas. Unfortunately, we did come up with a new approach. Instead of trying to figure out what are the relevant logical values within that 33 bytes, let's figure out what are the irrelevant values. And the way we did this was that we got access to a real master key to a real hotel. So it's an RFID card that opens all the doors in the hotel. We got one of those to a real hotel. We, we cloned it. And then we started corrupting fields and values from that card one by one. Now, if you corrupt one field and you try to open the door and the key still works, you know that that field is irrelevant. It doesn't play any role for creating a master key. And eventually, we were able to identify the relevant field or fields, depending on how you count it. And at this point, we had just one problem, and key space is one of them. 
If you have a large key space or if you have multiple different values you need to try, what you typically do is you brute force. And that's what we did. For that, you need to have some sort of hardware because the kind of brute forcing we had to do, we had to do it against the lock. We, we had to simulate different keys and try whether the lock opens or not. We couldn't do the brute forcing against the card. We had to do it against the lock. So to do this, we wrote custom Proxmark firmware. Mm. It's really not that difficult because the building blocks are already there. There's already the function which nowadays successfully simulates a tag. You just give it the payload and that's it. The second thing which was maybe more challenging to figure out was that if you want the lock to read the card again or let's say repeatedly, well, what you can do as a human, you can show it a card, then you take the card away from the radio field and then you show it another card. That's the natural way to do it. But you need to remove the card from the radio field somehow. And it took some time to figure out how to do this in the Proxmark firmware. What we ended up doing was that we, we realized that we somehow need to disable the radio field. So now remember that the Proxmark is simulating a card. So what we did was we, we just turned off the radio field of the Proxmark completely. Because at that point the lock is like, okay, the card disappeared somewhere. And how we did the disabling was we simply switched the Proxmark again to the listening mode. So instead of simulating, it was acting as a reader. That's like super ugly way to do it. There might be a better way to do it. I don't know, but this one worked. And we had a work, working brute forcer. What, what it simply does is it tries one payload, so it simulates one card. If it doesn't work, it simulates a different card with slightly modified data and keeps on doing that in a loop. Quite, quite straightforward. And the speed of the brute forcing is awesome. It's like one attempt per second. So what does it mean in practice? In practice, it means that if you have that one relevant field, and if the length of the field is four bits, it takes you 16 seconds, which is not bad. If it's 16 bits, it takes you 18 hours. And I can tell you that it was more than 16 bits. So you're looking at numbers like this. What this means is that, yeah, even though we had a brute force, the attack, it, it just wasn't feasible in the real world. So we, once again, we were, we were kind of stuck. We knew that this should be doable, but we couldn't really do it. And we really, really, really wanted to be the MacGyver. We wanted to do this in the real world. So we went back to square one, and earlier, we had done some attack surface mapping or, or open source intelligence of the Assembly uh, vision infrastructure. And we had, I, I remember that somewhere there, there was a screenshot of a website that was kind of educating the people who are mostly installing this system. It's called Assembly University. And we came, came up with a plan that there has to be a routine how these things are being installed. One thing you need to understand here is that these systems are super versatile. That's the reason why they are being, well, basically they are the global leader in the locking industry or hospitality industry. And the reason is that you can put them anywhere. You can put them into the boats or locks or yachts or cruise ships. Uh, like uh, hospitals, uh, hotels, anything related to the hospital industry. And all those setups are different. So you have to be able to customize it to, to, like, to the extreme. So we came up with this idea that there are simply too many combinations here. So even if you would have the demo installation and you would reverse engineer that to death, that wouldn't really help you because all the installations out there are actually kind of snowflakes. They are unique. And, and this, this was also the issue that we were facing. So we had this idea that, okay, maybe there is a process. Maybe there is a process how these guys are deploying these locks and maybe we can, if we learn how the process works, maybe we can exploit the actual process. Unfortunately, we didn't have access to this university, uh, but 
because we had literally hundreds of samples, we were able to look at those samples and came up with a plan. And this is basically how it looks in the real world. So this is a long version of the video that you show in the begin saw in the beginning of the talk. So first, the victim checks into a hotel. The victim could be us in this case. But let's, for the sake of discussion, let's say that somebody forgets her access token there for half a second. We clone it, and then we find either one or multiple locks. And we uh, iterate the values against the lock so long that the, the uh, light turns green. And then we can go to an elevator. And, and like you can see, the buttons don't stick. But if we show our card, you can get to all the floors, whereas a regular key would only give you access to one floor. That's how you, we knew that you're basi basically what we have is a master key and allows us to go each and to each and every door on that building. And we were able to do it without breaking the law. Because as far as we know, there is no law for banning us playing with the buttons on the elevator. So the title of the talk is Ghost in the Locks. And now we'd like to explain what we mean by that. So a successful attack requires a token. It, and this can be any token from that, car, the, from that facility. So it can be an expired one, it can be a current one, it can be to the garage door, to the gym. You just, you just need to have a token. Basically, the only information we need there is the, the piece of information that identifies the facility. And then we need a lock so we can test our newly created key space items against a valid lock and then we are claiming that we will become a ghost. So let's talk about those locks. We can test these, uh, the, the, the Proxmark attack toolkit that we have, we can test it against a single lock, but we could also distribute it to a number of locks. So we can make a single attempt against an any given lock on that floor, for example or on that facility. And there is an audit trail. If you take a look at the documentation, it says that the high-end version of this, there are multiple versions of these locks, electronic locks as well, but the high-end version, the most elegant one, is able to store 600 events. The problem is that it also mentions the values that are being documented on the audit trail, and the only thing that attacker does not control is the timestamp. So you cannot really trust any of the things at the log uh, of that lock. So if that wouldn't be bad enough, remember this one? This is the gear that is being used to program those locks. This is the same gear that is being used to read the logs from the system. So it's Adidas network. If you want to inspect any incidents on that facility, you need to go to an each and every door and analyze those logs manually. So you need to download the logs from that specific lock that you just chose and collect them and do correlation analysis. I can tell you that even if you were brave enough to do this, it wouldn't really help because 600 items is not a lot. And if we as an attacker control everything except the timestamp, we can make sure that even the locks that get stored somewhere, in, in the case of incident response assignment, we can make sure that the content is what we want there to be. For example, we could frame people. We could frame the hotel manager. We could frame the receptionist. We could do whatever we want to. And also, what the video doesn't show is that not only we can generate master keys, but we can impersonate any guest at that hotel. So we can choose a specific room and make a key for that room. And it will, it will be valid for forever. So 
that's effectively what we mean by being a ghost. So basically the only thing left was pose like a boss. But wait, that's not all. If you're working in this industry, remember the backend system. This would be the first thing that you do. If you get a copy of this software, this is what you do. You take a look at the attack surface and you will see if you find anything interesting there. So this is the beauty that you're looking at. It doesn't look like it's, it was done in 2018, right? So if you list the shares on that, you will find out also from the documentation side that the database folder on that machine is being shared over the network. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any real-world installations where this would have been true. But we took a look at it, and it seems to be the case. But there is a thing that is a much more interesting one, and that's the database. It's running this Sybase adaptive server anywhere, which is older than I am, which means about 2,000 years old. And the most difficult part here was to find a piece of code that would actually allow us to connect that database. Um, we took a look at the code and found an algorithm that is being, being used to generate the database credentials at the install time. And these are the credentials for the default database, if you ever want to have a look at, look at it. And if you enter those, you can actually use any tool that has the proper drivers to have full control over the database. So we wrote some tools for that. The first one being visualizing the whole database structure. And here you can find some really interesting stuff. You can find all the information about employees and the structure that is being used to store the data. You can find all, all the card user. This is basically the guest information that the system is storing. And armed with this information, we wrote a small utility that if we are just in the same network, we can dump the whole database of that facility. In real life, it's a lot faster. We just had to slow it down because of the video. So, once again, the only thing left was pretty much... <laughs> Conclusions. Sometimes hacking is just spending more time on something that anybody would reasonably expect. We spent 15 years on this. It was on and off research. This was a project that we just felt that it had to be done. It took a long time. And one thing that we learned during this was that making these type of systems is super hard. If you have a mechanical lock, the only thing you need to get right is basically mechanics. If you're dealing with these type of systems, you need to get the mechanics right, but you need to get the electronics right, you need to get all the communication protocols right, you need to have proper software development lifecycle in place, like secure SDLC, secure development lifecycle services in place. You need to know how the attacker would target it, you need to make your hardware tamper resistant, and so on and so on. There is simply the attack surface on these type of systems is huge. If you were a criminal and you would like to misuse this, there are way simpler ways to own hotel rooms. So it's, this exercise was kind of pointless. We just wanted to do it. We would like to thank Asa Bloy. Hey, took us very, very seriously, seriously from the very, very beginning. On the first meeting, when we reported this uh, to them, uh, they, they sent their CTO and their head of engineering to meet us. And they actually had set up a lab environment. And our job was to open those locks without pretty much knowing nothing about those, uh, that environment. And we were able to do that 
And then they told us that, you know, it took you guys 15 years to do this. Would you be willing to wait for another 15 years to release it? And we told them that no. That they would actually, this was supposed to be our talk last year, but at that time we were still cooperating with them and, and trying to make sure that their customers are safe. So we couldn't really release this. We would also like to send some greetings to our friends. Mikko Hyppänen for being our hotel key courier. It's nice to have friends in low places. So if you have a guy who happens to travel like 250 days a year, it helps to collect a few samples out there. Ulle for doing some hardware analysis. Mr. Steel for some early reverse engineering. Dist for doing some awesome 3D Proxmark cases for us. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a finished design key Proxmark case, talk to Dist. Uh, PH Neutral, which was the conference that we were visiting back then, it does not exist anymore. Team Voldev and Halver and the T2 crew and everybody else we forgot. This is also the place where we would like to thank the community. Lately we've been a bit worried that the tone of the voice has changed a bit. Remember, be, be kind to each other. We are, everybody starts from somewhere. And we are all noobs when it comes to new areas. Be nice to each other and share information. I guess we have eight minutes for questions. So if you have anything, feel free to ask. There's one. What's your recommendation to the uh, hotel or electronic um, card key industry? Sir? So what, uh, what would be your recommendation to a large publicly held uh, hotel owner operator, someone that maybe had 6,000 hotel properties on the planet? So we know one system which is now very, very secure. So you might want to use vision to secure your facilities, because as far as we know, that's the only system that has been thoroughly looked at. At least it's the, the one that has been looked longest. Yeah, we, we work together with um, ASA Uploy for free to design the fixes. So at least, at least we think that the fixed version of um, Vision is, is very secure. If you're running something that hasn't been assessed at any point, you probably want somebody skilled to do a proper security assessment for the system. There, there are systems that look really good on paper. I mean, it might have all the buzzwords, but in reality, there might be trivial ways to bypass it. This, this, that's actually a very, very valid point. So maybe it's worth pointing out that on paper, this system looks really good. It's, it's, it would be easy to make fun of Asabloy here, but the truth is that those guys were actually way ahead in their game. Mm -hmm. So this was more like subtle things here and there and combining them into an exploit chain that made the attack possible. All right, so in the model where the doors or the locks don't actually talk to any central server, how did the doors or locks trust? Or how do they know that it's even a valid key? Is there a public key? thing or is it just symmetric key? So all the locks are being programmed with the access token that they give you. So with, uh, for example, RFID card, the reception, so basically the, the only thing that the lock has is a real-time clock and a rudimentary data storage. So once they write the information to your RFID card, when you first time show it to the lock, it sees that, okay, now I have a new card here, which I have not seen before, and then it looks for some magic values there, and then it will reprogram the lock if the rules are fine, or, or if the magic values are fine. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. So there was, uh, well, essentially a shared secret, not shared over the wire, but uh, shared pre-shared secret, let's say that way. No, uh, was there any tamper-proofness? Yeah, that's a fair statement, yeah.
So you have, uh, as Abloy has provided the patch, uh, what is your estimate of how big uh, percentage of the hospitality industry has actually patched their systems? So that's a very, very good question. And for obvious reasons, us Abloy has not provided us really the information. But um, once we came out with this, we've been lucky to give this presentation a few times on different continents. And we've been to a few hotels. And all of those have been patched. Mm -hmm. We actually wrote a small tool to verify if the low hotel has been patched, but we never published that. So. Um, Based on our empirical experience, all the big chains have patched. And at least I personally have been positively surprised yeah. of how many hotels have patched. Maybe it's worth mentioning here as well that we did wait for one year to us employ to get their stuff together. And we did cooperate with them fully. So we did it without money, we did it free of charge. We just wanted to make sure that their customers are safe. I think we postponed publishing this research, what, three, four times? Yeah. At least, yeah. Um, hey, uh, as I got it, it was crucial that you got the master key here. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Okay, so I, I got that it was crucial for you to get the master key to play around and fuzz it. How did you get the master key? We asked kindly. We have friends in low places, we already told you. <laughs> okay, so basically without that, you would have been stuck at that point. You know, you, 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 saw, you just go to a very, very high-end hotel, you rent a suite, and then you ask kindly that, could I get a master key? Because I already have the best room here, as it usually works. It's, it's difficult to say what would have happened if we never got access to the real master key. That's it, the path that we took with it this would have, It would have made this more difficult. Yeah. Like mentioned earlier, reverse engineering just the software side, even if you would reverse engineer it fully, and it's huge. Uh, there is lots of reversing there. Uh, it wouldn't really get you to the end game yeah. because you need to have access to at least few real-world installations, so you will see how the thing works in the, in the, on the wild. Yeah. But if you didn't get it from the presentation yet, I think it's fair to say that <laughs> we, we are too stupid to like, not give up, so we would have kept going, we would have found another way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, would the case have been a little bit different if the card uh, would have been, for example, a different kind of MyFair card, like Desfire? Sorry, it's, it's super hard to hear the questions because the, the yeah. noise from so the background is so huge. If the card type would have been different, like MyFair Desfire, would this kind of attack been possible? So the ultralight version so, definitely doesn't contain any encryption between the so, three um, but The question was that if the RFID card would have been different, uh, had, it, had it changed the game? Yes, it would have. But then, then again, the locks will always have the other half of the key. And very often, these systems are shared secret schemes. So it would have raised the bar but it wouldn't solve the issue fully. But yes, using better RFID cards would have made it much more difficult. But the thing is that about 30% of the cards go missing every single day from a hotel. And if your access token to the hotel room costs like one euro, you can imagine how much money the hotels lose on those cards every day. So they try to avoid using super expensive access tokens. Yeah. So that's why everybody's going to these mobile key solutions, because it's much more cost effective. 
I, I bet there's not many hotels that would be willing to pay for those desk fire cars. Yep. Yeah, those are simply too expensive. Okay, I guess we're out of time. Yep. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.